Hello, I'm Doug Wood from the University of Washington, and today we're going to be having a roundtable about lung cancer screening, a very important topic uh, for us uh, this year. And I'd like, uh, I've got several great uh, panelists with me. I'd like e each of them to introduce themselves as well. I'm Dorit Jerome, I'm a thoracic surgeon at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm delighted to be here today. I'm Linda Martin, I'm a thoracic surgeon at the University of Virginia. I'm Betty Tong, I'm a general thoracic surgeon at Duke University, North Carolina. I'm Mari Antonoff, I'm a general thoracic surgeon at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. So just to give us a little bit of background, we're now approximately two years into having approval at the federal level for lung cancer screening, which has been an enormous uh, step positive for us in early detection of lung cancer, a chance to save a lot of lives and, and to impact how we care for patients uh, with such a serious malignancy. Um, and so we wanted to talk uh, about how do we implement lung cancer screening? What are some of the barriers in doing that? Because it's such an active aspect in our practices today and how we're delivering lung cancer care. So my first question uh, uh, to Betty and to Mara is, what <coughs> model have you used for developing a lung cancer screening program at your center? Betty? So our model involves advanced practice providers who have also earned their certified tobacco treatment counseling uh, certification. We have a workflow in which the patient eligibility is confirmed by these providers prior to scheduling a screening appointment. On the day of the appointment, the patient checks into the screening clinic. They meet with the provider for the shared decision-making discussion. After that, the patient goes to radiology for their low-dose CT scan, and then they return to the clinic uh, afterward. Our colleagues in chest radiology provide at least a preliminary report by telephone uh, of the scan within an hour. Following the scan, when the patient returns to the clinic, uh, they come for two reasons. One, to discuss smoking cessation or continued abstinence, and second, to review the study and any preliminary results. We feel that by reviewing the scan in person, we help to alleviate the patient anxiety about the potential findings, and we're also able to discuss their follow-up and actually make that appointment prior to their checking out from the clinic. Great. Marl, how do you do things at MD Anderson? Sure. Uh, we have a workflow that's actually very similar to what Betty has described, um, involving advanced care um, nurse practitioners and screening telephone call, many of the similar steps. I will say it's a little bit different at a cancer center such as MD Anderson. Many of the patients that we treat at our institution come from far, and so as we know, we all want lung cancer screening to be part of routine screening, such as mammography and colonoscopy, and when people think about the routine healthcare, they don't necessarily travel far to go to a major cancer center. So what we've done at MD Anderson, at, at least at our main campus, we've really incorporated um, an important aspect of our lung cancer screening is participation in a clinical trial to help find biomarkers to hopefully, eventually, re replace the actual lung cancer screening uh, CT scan. But for now, enrollment in the clinical trials has been a, a big driver for people coming to our main campus. So that goes into our workflow as well, the blood draws that go along and the consenting as well. Um, in addition, in order to try to really help the people in our local area who do need lung cancer screening, we have also been working to bring our lung cancer screening program out to our Houston area locations. So I've had the opportunity to pilot that in one of our Houston area locations and really trying to target the community in that area um, in order to ensure that they're getting proper screening. Terrific. So one of the difficulties, um, uh, and I'll direct this to you, Dr. Durar, is how do you how do you track the patients? Do you use a patient tracking software? Uh, how do you assure follow-up? How do you assure that they come back in a year and they get their annual follow-up scan? I think this is uh, certainly a challenge. We established a lung cancer screening program in one of our community hospitals in North Philly, which has certainly uh, an underserved pop population. And we were convinced from very early on that lung cancer screening should be driven by the primary care physicians. So we had them actually order the scan. Uh, it was reported back to the primary care physicians. We did have a lung cancer navigator that sort of made sure that uh, a follow-up phone call was made to the, um, <clears throat> to the patient, but we did not employ software, which would obviously be ideal if it's incorporated into your medical records and would, first of all, screen for you which patients are eligible, but also then kind of remind you um, <clears throat> when to order the next scan. I think it goes back to <clears throat> the CMS mandate of shared decision-making 
and whoever uh, is in charge of ordering the scan should have a discussion with the patient that indeed you're quite likely to have a follow-up scan um, in the order of 26 to 30 percent. That's if you have a false positive scan that mandates a scan earlier than just the annual follow-up and that really um, it's not done with, with just one scan. You really have to come back on a routine basis to really get the benefits of lung cancer screening. Yes, that's right. Certainly lung cancer screening is a process, it's not a scan. Uh, that's something we, we've, uh, we've recognized and uh, need to educate our patients about as well. Um, related to that are abnormal findings and how you work up abnormal findings, who does it, what kind of uh, multidisciplinary group, if any, does that. Uh, so Dr. Martin, how does that work in your institution? So I've had two different experiences with this. Currently at the University of Virginia, we've got a lung cancer screening group that meets on a quarterly basis. And so we talked about this as a group, as how to do the workflow. And we've been lucky enough to have a nurse practitioner that's funded by Tobacco Indemnification Fund for three years. And we wanted to make things as streamlined as possible for her. So we came, went through the NCCN guidelines and the lung rad scores. We looked at areas where there might be differences or controversies and as a group came up with algorithms for her so that whenever possible she can provide that seamless care for the patients. And if there's some aberration or something that's off the charts there, then she'll contact either myself or Dr. Mike Hanley, our director from the radiology standpoint, and get guidance from us. Okay. Well, and I'll mention a little of how we do this at the University of Washington. Um, we developed a lung cancer early detection and prevention uh, program a number of years ago, and then that's morphed into our lung cancer screening program. And we have a weekly clinic that includes all of the patients that have abnormal findings. And actually, at the beginning of the day, at seven in the morning, at the beginning of the day before that clinic, we have a multidisciplinary uh, in-face uh, meeting of thoracic radiology, thoracic surgery, and pulmonary medicine, and sometimes medical oncology as well, and go patient by patient through all the patients that are gonna be seen that day and develop a multidisciplinary strategy for what we're going to advise for that patient, be it biopsy or PET imaging or referral to surgery, or sometimes just an annual follow-up. Yeah. So I've seen two different ways. At the University of Virginia, we have an algorithm, and if there's, an, say, a lung nodule of eight millimeters or greater, in our institution, that's an automatic referral to thoracic surgery with the same day PET scan. But I've worked in other institutions where we did this in more of a community setting and we had community private practice radiologists that read all sorts of images and not just chest images. And in that sitting, I insisted on a second read uh, so that we'd have two observers to confirm abnormal findings and any of those scans that required a second read, we would review in the tumor board with the group. Mm -hmm. So I had a little more checks and balances in a different setting, so I think it just has to depend on your resources and your expertise at your institution. Understood. So one of the things when we're developing new programs, uh, and this is definitely a new program in most of our centers, is the kind of programmatic barriers, administrative barriers, and kind of getting things up and running. And I know that's a lot of what people are interested in or, or barriers that they have. Um, Dr. Tong, what barriers have, have you had to overcome in getting lung cancer screening uh, going at your institution? I think um, programmatically speaking, one of the greatest challenges that we face is ensuring patient eligibility for scans that are ordered outside the purview of our screening program. So administrative and institutionally, we don't restrict the ordering of low-dose CT scans for screening to our lung cancer screening program. And so about two-thirds of scans are ordered in our institution are ordered by either primary care or other specialty providers. What we found in our early experience is that nearly 25% of all those studies ordered by other providers were for patients who didn't meet any of the criteria specified by either the USPSTF or by CMS. If we expanded this to consider patients who met the NCCN Category 2 uh, criteria, it was still nearly 17% of patients who didn't meet any published criteria for lung cancer screening. We also found that for patients who underwent screening outside the purview of the program, there were significant administrative deficiencies in terms of documenting the shared decision making. Um, as an example, uh, about only two thirds of the providers who ordered screening studies did any uh, tobacco cessation counseling. Um, and uh, in addition, even more uh, alarming, if you will, is that only about one in five 
actually documented shared decision making, much less with a decision aid. Uh, so we <coughs> we address that by by doing some provider education and actually enlisting the the help of our our partners in compliance and regulatory regulatory as well. Well, that's great, and that that's actually a great segue to my my next question to Dr. Gerard, which is. Um, um, how do you educate your local primary care doctors? How, how do you first inform them uh, about which patients ought to be considered for lung cancer screening, uh, as well as what aids to use or, or what methods to use for getting patients into a lung cancer screening program? Uh, what, what have you found with that? What has worked or what have been the barriers for you? So we started our initial uh, free lung cancer screening program in the fall of 2013, and this was sort of a uh, very exciting time. Um, the NLST was published, the ATS and U.S. former president uh, strongly advocated dissemination of lung cancer screening. The NCCN embar uh, embraced it, and some other institutions were more reluctant to actually um, uh, move forward. Uh, and um, including, for example, the American Academy of Family Physicians, I think they were a little reluctant to really endorse that. And so we felt that we actually um, <clears throat> modeled our experience at a local community hospital according to the Leahy Clinic, um, and they were very helpful, and they really felt that it should be in the hands of uh, primary care physicians. So we actually had flyers um, in the hospital. When you open a computer, you got some of those um, you know, flyers that would change, obviously, but some of these um, reminders of what lung cancer screening is about, the eligibility criteria. And we had actually a lot, we went a lot to the primary care physicians that edu education. And we organized at the end of all these efforts, we actually organized a free lung cancer symposium on a Saturday morning for our primary care physicians to come be educated. So it was a lot of work. And what we also learned is that um, <clears throat> if the ones that um, found an early stage lung cancer, those were really. Uh, became ardent supporters of the program, and so we had to win them over one by one, so to speak, you know, and we, we looked at our uh, base of primary care physicians, and, and most of the referrals came from very few providers, and so we had to work our way through the, <laughs> them to really convince them of the benefits, and um, it, 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 there was a little it got harder down the road with the CMS requirements of additional pre-certification, documentation, and so forth. So you, you make a great point about how uh, it's, a, it's a process of mm -hmm. also educating the primary care providers who are the ones that really implement lung cancer screening. Sometimes systems can have an impact on that. Has your system used the electronic health record in one of a couple of ways, either as alerts for primary care providers when they have patients that have risk factors, it gives them a pop-up alert mm -hmm. about suggesting uh, a conversation on lung cancer screening and or uh, a, a different mechanism for ordering a low-dose CT for lung cancer screening that has some uh, check marks for that. Have you employed the electronic health record to help support the process? At our institution, we have not, we have worked on it, but we had so many changes in terms of actually rolling out electronic records to the outpatient uh, clinic world that we did not make that yet part of our algorithm. Obviously, it would be ideal, um, just as primary care physicians get alerted if a patient needs an A1C level uh, and some other preventive measures as part of the quality metrics that they actually get uh, held accountable for. Is, um, uh, we have, uh, that would be the ideal solution. I'm interested to hear what other institutions have succeeded in. Um, that was our ultimate goal. goal, right. goal. So, um, what I'm interested in, we'll, we'll start to wrap up with this, is um, what we use for making recommendations for lung cancer screening. So if we just even look at large national level policy or decisions, there's at least three different groups of patients that uh, could be considered for lung cancer screening with obviously a majority of overlap. But Dr. Martin, uh, how do you intake patients and which ones are accepted for lung cancer screening? What uh, either policy or guidelines does your group follow for uh, the accepting patients for lung cancer screening? Right, so I think you're referring that the NCCN guidelines have different categories of recommendations, but the coverage 
uh, by CMS and so forth doesn't always exactly match with that. So our program currently is trying to adhere as much as possible to the CMS approved criteria. Uh, I think we're certainly open to expanding that, but we're still figuring out how to get reimbursement and how to keep our program afloat as well. Mm -hmm. So we're sticking with the guidelines presently and getting to the uh, use of electronic medical record we found with some of the triggers to, to let us know who qualifies, we're finding that there's not very accurate reporting of smoking history in EPIC, for example. And so if you use that as a trigger, you're gonna have problems. And so we have a checkpoint too where our nurse practitioner does a quick phone call before they come in to make sure they actually meet the criteria so they save the patient a visit if they don't meet the criteria. Right, that's a good, good technique. Uh, Dr. Antonoff, what about MD Anderson? Uh, you know, there's USPSTF, 55 to 80. There's CMS, 55 to 77. Uh, there's NCCN guidelines, which have kind of category one and category two. Yeah. What, what, uh, what group do you use for accepting for lung cancer screening? Sure, well, we're actually very fortunate because as I mentioned before, we do have a clinical trial that relates to our lung cancer screening. And patients come in knowing that they don't obviously have to consent for the trial, but they recognize that our criteria are quite expanded for patients who are part participate in the trial. So we are able, we don't have an upper age limit for those who participate in the trial. Um, and we are able to lower the lower end of the age limit for patients if they have an additional risk factor. So they recognize that if they don't meet those criteria, then um, if they don't meet the standard criteria, I guess I should say, where CMS would, would, would cover them, then um, if they don't participate in the trial, then they may be partially responsible for the cost of their, of their scan. So in general, um, most patients do want to participate in the trial, but if they don't, they understand that the criteria are a little bit more constrained in terms of uh, achieving a, a payment and reimbursement. Well, and I'll, I'll just say that in our own center, uh, obviously there's coverage policy, uh, and coverage policy is is close but not completely the same between USPSTF guidelines uh, and CMS decisions uh, regarding the age, but they're both approximately 55 to 77 years old with the 30-pack year smoking history. Although interestingly, if you've stopped smoking for more than 15 years, that goes away. Um, NCCN recognized that there are other risk factors for lung cancer besides the age and smoking variables. and and added those in as additional uh, considerations and really all risk calculators for lung cancer use other variables as well, which is why the NCCN has those additional characteristics to be considered. We do accept those patients, but recognize that coverage decisions for them may be different uh, since the coverage decisions are made by CMS and USPSTF policy. Um, just to close up, I think that this is a, a terrific day for those of us that are caring for patients with lung cancer because now with the ability to have early detection, we take a cancer that is by far the most common cause of cancer death in the United States and actually have probably the most powerful tool that we have in decreasing the number of, of annual mortalities that we have from lung cancer. In fact, the calculations are that if we really implemented lung cancer screening that we could save as many as 12 to 15,000 deaths per year from lung cancer. So early detection is a wonderful new, new tool that we have for lung cancer uh, and lung cancer management. We've got experts here that have implemented lung cancer screening in their own centers uh, and have talked some about the barriers as well as the, the uh, benefits of lung cancer screening in their institutions. And so. Uh, we hope that this provides a little bit of help for those of you who are developing lung cancer screening programs uh, in your own hospitals and medical centers. Thank you very much.